was uh, privileged to get to spend a lot of time with my grandparents and my great-grandparents. There's nothing like a grandma and grandpa. Amen? There's just something about them that make, uh, makes life go round. My grandma Dorothy was one who I spent an incredible amount of time with because uh, when I was growing up, my dad worked nights and my mom worked days. And before we, I got old enough to go to school, I, I spent all my time with Grandma Dorothy. Uh, she was my mom's mom, and she was uh, this incredible woman of faith, pure Irish, a little bit of spunk, not a lot of spunk, no, an incredible amount of spunk. And she was just one of those kinds of, of women of faith who knew what to say when it needed to be said, and often came up with statements that left me as a child scratching my head. So one of her favorites was, take the if out of life and you have nothing left. And I remember wondering what in the world she meant, take the if out of life and you have nothing left. Well, was it a play on words? Was it just something to cause confusion in my mind? And I remember, I'm not sure about how old I was, I think I was probably in about junior high school, I finally got enough guts up to ask Grandma what in the world she was talking about. You have to be careful because she was of the mind that sometimes questions could be deemed as talking back and, and she didn't tolerate that. And I remember asking her, and she said something I've never forgotten. She said, John, if lies at the heart of life, and when we dare to ask the question, what if, we enter into all the possibilities that are before us. Let's say that again. If lies at the heart of life, and when we dare to ask the question, what if, we enter into the opportunities that are before us. I've, I've thought about that a lot in my life. How two simple little letters put together could introduce us to such an overwhelming, enormous body of information and knowledge and opportunity, because rightly asked, Cause us to think and to dream. What if? What if everybody you knew in your family loved Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength and loved their neighbors as themselves and served Jesus faithfully? Wouldn't you have the most amazing family in the world? What if that guy next door? Who can be really crotchety and grumpy when your kid's ball goes over the fence into their yard? Actually loves kids and would sit there and throw it back and wait for you to toss it back over the fence so they throw it back over again. What if? What if we lived in a world where brokenness is not existent? What if? We lived in a world where children never had to struggle with the realities of divorce or abuse. What if? Can you imagine the possibilities? Over the next uh, month or so, I'm going to share with you a number of messages built around that two-letter world word, if. Statements of Jesus, questions of Jesus that were all prefaced by that simple little word, if. If you believe, if you have faith, if you forgive, all sorts of opportunities. And as we walk through a number of those statements in the gospel, my prayer is that you will join me on a discovery the possibilities that God has set before us, and the realization that of, of, of what could happen if 
we just responded in the ways that Jesus was indicating and began to live the life that he called us to. We're going to begin this morning in the Gospel of Matthew in the 16th chapter. And I want to share with you uh, four verses that I have shared with you, I, I think, 12 or 13 times over the last 10 years. You, you've heard me preach from these verses often. Uh, maybe not in Matthew, but in, in other of the Gospels where the same words are spoken. And, and as we look at these words this morning, my, my simple prayer is this. You'll begin to ask the question, what if? What if I did what Jesus was saying? What if I became what Jesus was indicating I could become? What if I chose to live the life he intended? Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse number 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this should never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross follow me. What if we chose to come after Christ and following the formula that he gives in these verses, what if we truly followed him on his terms, the way he taught, the way he indicated we must live if we're truly going to be followers of Let's begin this morning by looking at the context. Uh, Jesus was nearing the end of the middle of the second year of his ministry. He, he's in what's called the year of public favor, when all of the crowd around him has been watching and seeing the miracles they're thronging to him, but the tide is starting to shift, and now uh, the religious entities in his world are beginning to rise up, and they're beginning to question, and they're beginning to, to feel threatened, and they're beginning to attack the ministry of Jesus. It's one of those days when the disciples who have been a part of everything he's been doing, who have heard his messages, who have seen his miracles, who have understood what he's all about, and suddenly begin to catch a glimpse of something different. And it's in the midst of that context that questions start to develop. And their faith starts to shake a little bit. But they start to wonder what really lies ahead, which brings us to the content of these verses. Uh, verse 21 says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now, now, folks, we read those words and we have absolutely no problem with them because on this side of the cross, we understand what Jesus is talking about. We realize it was the religious entities of his day that that put him to death. It was the religious entities of his day that, that pressured and pushed and beat and crucified him. And, and we don't struggle with that. But go back a little over 2,000 years and put yourself in the place of the 12. Who have seen this one identified as the Son of Man, who has come to bring healing and hope and grace and forgiveness to the world, who they've seen do miracles and heard preach, and and now he's saying he's going to be beat, he's going to die. They don't get it. And 
I don't know why it is, except for the fact that Peter's personality just kind of lent itself to being the one who'd step up, but, but he's the one who does, and he says, wait a minute, hold it, Jesus. I don't know what you're thinking, but this is not going to happen. Now, I'm not the brightest light bulb in the, in the box, but, but I know well enough who not to debate or disagree with. You know, there, there are times you, you really want to say something and you really want to do something and you really want to just make your thoughts and your feelings known. But then there's this little voice that says you best be quiet because you're about to get spanked if you open your mouth. And guess what happens when Peter opened his mouth? He got spanked. And what Jesus said sent shockwaves to the other disciples. Get the behind me, Satan. Your focus, your ideas, your beliefs, they have nothing to do with God's on man's interests, which are broken and sinful and reflect being lost, separated from God. Could, could you imagine what it would be like to have Jesus, whom you love with all of your heart, look at you and say, you're Satan. That's what happened. And it was interesting, in the midst of that entire discovery, and in that entire moment, certainly Peter had to think that was a little extreme. Think about what Jesus heard Peter saying. And Peter said, Lord, God, God forbid that would ever happen to you. What, what he heard Peter saying was, you're not going to do what you came here to do. You're not going to be the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world as the Father promised. You're not going to be that. You're not going to do that. We're going to stand in the way. It's, it's not going to happen. And Jesus looked at Peter, who was the mouthpiece at that moment for Satan, and said, get behind me. Interests aren't godly, they're manly, they're sinful, they're wrong. At which point Jesus then issued a call. And he simply said to his disciples, including Peter, whom he has just called Satan. have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And there is that incredible if statement. What if you really chose to follow Jesus? What if you chose to make him the Lord of your life and live that way. What if you determined to set everything else aside, everything that rivals him in your heart, and say, my eyes will be fixed on Jesus only? What if you chose him? I know what most of you are thinking already done that. Got saved long ago. Been living this Christian life just fine. But what would happen this morning if I dared to ask you to hear Jesus out? And to examine your life on his terms. To take a real look at what following him, coming after him, really 
What if this morning you chose to say, God, search me and help me to be the person you call and created me to be? Let's take a look at what Jesus said. He begins with these words, if anyone wishes to come after me. I want you to see what he's saying. You have a choice. I have a choice. We don't have to follow Jesus. We don't have to choose to live for him. We don't choose to have to be a disciple. We, we, we don't have to choose to make him Lord of our lives. He's not here to force us into that relationship. He's just saying, if you want to, here's what it's going to take. Now let's talk for a moment about the options. In the context of these verses, we can choose to pattern our lives after man's interests. We, we can choose to live doing the bidding of Satan. We can choose to reject holiness and obedience and love. We can choose to do that. But we can also choose to embrace him. And everything there is about him. And to say to him, I want you, Jesus, only. But he tells us in the words that follow, there's going to be a price. And I think too often in the church today, we struggle with this concept of what it really means to come after Jesus, to make the decision to follow him. It's easy to learn about him. It's easy to go to Sunday school. It's even easy to come to church. It's easy to read the Bible. It's easy to say and, and get involved in conversations that talk about God and his ways. But it's another thing completely to say, I choose to pattern my life after that. Far too often in the world that we live in, there's a lot of folks who never get beyond saying, oh, I'm saved. They never start to live that way. Oh, I want Jesus. But they never choose to live as a Christ focus. Let, let me illustrate it this way. You're aware of the fact that for the last three years I've worked with uh, our community's indoor football team, professional football team. Thank the Lord, the season was over. We, we, we died a, a, an ugly death this last year. But we have a new team coming, and, and they've asked me to be a part of it, and I'm excited about that. But, but I've worked with them long enough to know the difference between a, a real player and a poser. There are some folks who simply understand what it means to be a professional football player. It's reflected in their diet. It's reflected in the amount of sleep they get every day. It's reflected in the, the exercise they're committed to. It's, it's reflected in the hours they spend in the gym. It's reflected in the hours they spend watching film. It's reflected in the way they work to hone their craft because they want to be the very best they can be. But, but there are others who are there just because they like being able to say, I'm on the team. They kind of enjoy putting on the pads and the jersey and running out of the tunnel and having everybody clap. They like the lights. They like the fanfare. They like the fun. But you won't catch them dead in the gym. And they eat far too many of their meals at McDonald's. Not to say that McDonald's is unhealthy, but they eat there and it's kind of ugly. They're not really committed to exercise. And if they get sleep, that's okay. If they don't, that's okay too. One's the real deal. And 
and their life shows it. The other just wants the benefit, and their life doesn't communicate they're willing to pay the price. Let me bring that back into the church. There are folks every day who claim to be Christian. And yet any opportunity to walk away from Christ and to sin, they, they quickly embrace because it just feels good. They don't have to make any kind of radical commitment. Why in the world should I change the way I live my life? There's plenty of grace to go around. But there are others. Who live for Jesus only. And every part of their life is built around the decision to come after him. And if it doesn't reflect their pursuit of him, they don't make it a part of their journey. Which leads us to the description of what it takes. He, he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone chooses to follow me, here's what it's going to take. You're going to have to deny yourself. Why? I, I don't know why it is I keep finding myself coming back to this passage of Scripture. Except that we live in a world that embraces the opposite of self-denial. Look around. Everything has to be new. Everything has to be fancy. Everything has to be better. Everything has to be first. Everything has to be about me. And nothing. what? Too many people live thinking they deserve all this. I sit at the dining room table last night late and Debbie was reading and I was going over today's message and had slid that aside and pulled up another computer and was paying bills and Debbie looked at me and she said, um, have you paid our time? You know me, that's a really stupid question to ask. But I said, yes, honey, I've paid our tithe. Have you paid our faith promise? Well, yes, I, I include that every week with my tithe check. Do you give an offering? Yeah, I, I do a little extra every week just because I can and, and because I think that's a way for me just to reflect my gratitude. She goes, good. That's what we're supposed to do, John. As if I needed to hear that, but she made sure I did. Then she said, How are the bills? And I said, Well, um, have just about got everything paid off except the house, the medical bills left over from, from the stroke, a little car payment, and a little bit of school loan. But everything else is paid in full, and I got money left over. She goes, isn't it amazing what happens when you put God first and deny yourself? And it was like, honey, are you preaching tomorrow or am I? there are a lot of things we'd love to have. They don't fit in the budget. Oh, we could get them. But something would have to go. We wanted to help a kid get to camp like we did this year. We, we wouldn't be able to do that. We wanted to give them a project. We, we, we wouldn't be able to do that. When we wanted to buy groceries for somebody or pay a light bill for somebody, which we do occasionally, we, we, we wouldn't be able because we put all of our resources into us. I've learned something. That if you put 
God first. It's amazing how he blesses you. Jesus says, if you will deny yourself, you can come after me. And I wonder how many of us truly understand that. I spend time almost every day with people who struggle with finance and faith and, and work and family. And, and I usually ask them the same question. How much of all this is about you? And to a fault, every one of them will say, well, I, I, I guess I'm just selfish. And often I hollow the word bingo. That's what keeps us from being blessed with God. When we put ourselves first. But what does self-denial take? That brings me to the third thing I want to share this morning. Where Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and then take up his cross. I know what you're thinking. It's all about a vertical beam and a horizontal beam. It's all about a place called Golgotha. It's all about Jesus and him being the sacrifice of God for our sins. I would suggest to you, though, this morning, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about a physical piece of wood talking about being willing to make a decision and a commitment that will literally demand your all. Nothing else out. Nothing left out. Everything. You can follow me if Contemporary Christianity doesn't like to talk about that. Contemporary Christianity likes to talk about being blessed and having fun. And how if you really know Jesus, you'll drive nice cars and live in nice houses and wear fine clothes. And, and if you don't believe me, turn on any television preacher in the land on any given Sunday. Those are the things you'll hear. They reflect contemporary Christianity. Contemporary Christianity doesn't reflect Jesus, folks. Because Jesus talked about giving your all, expecting nothing in return. And does that reflect you? Which brings me to Jesus' final word. If we make the right choice and deny ourselves, and make the ultimate commitment, then we can follow Jesus. I find it interesting that Jesus places at the end of the statement the outcome which suggests you can't get there unless you do everything that comes before it. What if you made the right choice? What if you denied yourself? What if? you took up your cross, then guess what happens? You get to follow him. You get to, be, get to be numbered with him. You get to be called one of his own. And if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to make the right choice. You've got to live a life of self-denial and you've got to make a decision for faith that's willing to pay the ultimate price, then and only then can you truly follow and be called a follower of his. What if? What if every one of us in this room chose to live our lives? 
what if we move beyond the contemporary thoughts of what it means to be Christian to be focused on Jesus' thoughts and become what he says we must be and do to truly follow him? What if we followed Christ that way? I'll tell you what I think the outcome would be. It's found in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. The Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Because when folks live this kind of life, it's attractive. It's transformational. It produces change. And it draws people like steel is to a magnet. Because folks want to have. Here's the question. If right now, this very moment, Jesus physically came into this room and, and separated it, this congregation into two groups, not based on what we think, but based on what he knows, what would happen if right now separated us into two groups, one being those who follow on his terms, and the other being those who don't. Which side would you be found on this morning? The side of the true follower? Who lives life according to his terms, denying self, taking up your cross, Choosing him only. Or the other side. It tries to make it more about you. And less about him. Wanting all the blessings, but not willing to pay the price. <coughs> Which side would you wind up on? Starting to understand a little bit more why my grandmother said, Take the if out of life, you have nothing. <coughs> but when if is in there, you see the incredible possibilities of life you live. And in this case, it's the life of the true follower, Jesus. Where would you be found this morning if Jesus came in? And separate us into two camps, those of the true followers and those who aren't. Where would you be? Father, help us this morning to hear your word and to act upon it. Today, if there is question in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, that we might not be living life on Jesus' terms, would you help us right now to follow his prescription, to make the right choice, to deny ourselves, and to make a commitment so complete and so entire that we would give our all in order that we might follow him. Lead us, Lord. And I pray we'd be faithful to follow in Jesus' name. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. I invite you to Sunday school. I'll be starting in just a few minutes. And then church tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless.